Well, good day, everyone, and we're so glad you've joined us once again for our Bible study. I'm Pastor Jim Wright from Full Gospel Church in St. Catharines, and we're so grateful to see you once again as we work through the book of James together. We have been doing this study since January, and I'm certainly glad for all I've learned and glad for so many of you that have taken the time to join me for this study about practical faith in critical times. Now, I have no idea what the possibilities and the opportunities will be open to us in September, but I do know this, that this will be the final study before the summer break. I can't predict whether we will formally finish this study. I'm actually praying along with you that it will be a brand new day by then and there will be fresh opportunities and fresh ideas and fresh things and uh, we will be jumping into something new come September. So I won't say we won't start this again and finish up. I've got two or three studies still in the books, but we will uh, we may well let them go and start with something fresh again in September. Well, you know these past few weeks, I don't know if you've been watching the news, I trust you have, but this coronavirus infection thing is starting to climb back up in many places because of this Delta variant they're talking about that uh, was not a word that any of us wanted to hear. Since the news has come out, I've heard a lot of frustrated talk from a lot of unhappy people. We were all hoping that this might be the light at the end of the tunnel and not another train, but apparently we shall see because the infection numbers are starting to rise. As we're going through this COVID-19 pandemic right now, there's a word I would use today as we put our final study together before summer. A word I would use to describe everybody that I know and the way that they feel right now. I think the word is tired. Tired. They're fatigued. We're tired of change. The people in Ontario are tired of being the most locked up, locked down province in, uh, in Canada. People are tired here of being out of work. People are tired of all kinds of things, worn out from all the changes and adjustments we've had to make because of this coronavirus. We don't really feel like being patient anymore. But today we're going to go to James chapter 5, the fifth chapter of the book of James, verse five to se verse 7 through 11. And I'm kind of glad we're here because I need to be reminded from this classic passage on patience in the face of the Lord's return about how to be patient <laughs> in the midst of a problem. How to be patient when things are taking longer than I want them to take. Because they are. So I've entitled this study today, Faith That Handles Delays Patiently. And boy, has this been a study. I feel that this is what God wants us to talk about today. Because here's what I've discovered. I don't know if you have, that sometimes the greatest step of faith we can take is to do nothing but wait for God to show us the next step. Simply waiting on God, waiting when things aren't moving as fast as we'd like sometimes sitting still for a moment and taking time with God to begin to reflect on the future takes as much energy or more energy from, from us or out of us than it does to run around and do something that makes us feel like we're going somewhere. So let's go to James chapter 5. Would you? I trust your Bible's already open there and turn to and slide your finger down till you get to verse 7. Let's read it together and then pray and get started. Be patient then, dear brothers, James writes, and sisters, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and the spring rain. You too be patient. Stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. And don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. For the judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, and as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count blessed those who have persevered. You've probably heard about Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally 
brought about in his circumstances. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. You know, learning to wait is probably one of the most difficult lessons that I am learning in life. It's the mark of one of the primary marks of maturity. Children and immature people have trouble waiting. And James shows us why and how to develop patience when things are taking longer than we expected. When we're dealing with, like today, faith that has to handle delays patiently. And six times in this passage that I just read to you, it talks about patience or perseverance. And James gives us three examples. And with those three examples, I'm going to answer three questions. Using each of those three examples each time to give you part of the answer to how to have faith that handles delays patiently. What are the three questions? Well, let me give them to you before we pray. Faith that handles delays patiently asks this question. When is waiting patiently an act of faith? Because sometimes <laughs> it's not. What should I remember while I'm waiting? And how do I trust God when, I'm the, when what I'm waiting for has been delayed? All right, let's look at these from James chapter 5. But before we do... Let's pray together, shall we? Father, open our eyes and our ears and our hearts as we step forward. As summer comes upon us and we look for opportunity, as we th see things beginning to wind down and it looks like this pandemic might be coming to a close, we ask that you will give us your wisdom and grace that we will be able to handle these delays patiently that we can act like your children in the midst of a time of tremendous frustration and weariness. Bless each one that hears and listens today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, so, when is acting patiently or waiting patiently an act of faith? Well, it's an act of faith when the circumstances around me are uncontrollable. Now that certainly applies to what we're going through right now with COVID-19 because none of us is really in control of this. But friends, reality check. Most of life, most of the life that we live here under the sun is out of our control. James uses the farmer in chapter 5 to describe this side of things for us. Look at James chapter 5, verses 7 and 8 with me. So wait patiently. There it is. Brothers and sisters, until the coming of the Lord, the farmer waits expectantly for the precious harvest from the land, being patient about it until he receives the early and late rains. You too be patient. Strengthen your hearts. Keep them energized and firmly committed to God because the coming of the Lord is near. James says the Lord is coming. And his congregation looked at him and says, I don't know if I can wait that long. <laughs> well, he says, look at the farmer then. Look at the farmer because farming requires a lot of patience and there are so many unpredictable factors. There's no such thing as an overnight crop. You prepare the soil, you plant something in the ground and you wait and you wait and you wait and you weed and you prune and you pray and eventually after a whole lot of waiting you get a harvest and those are the predictable factors then there are the uncontrollable factors like the wind and the weather and the bugs and the economy and the prices for the product and all that demands faith of the farmer even when we know something is in control uncontrollable here's what i know about you and me is not so we try and control it in fact, I was reading the other day and the author said, if you ever want to know if you're trying to control the uncontrollable, ask yourself this question. And I said, what question? He said this, am I worrying about it? Because worrying is, of course, the most ineffective way of controlling anything. But it's the method we most often use. Because to worry about something is fruitless. It can't change anything. And the Bible calls us to patience because the writers of the biblical text recognize when we worry, we're trying to control the uncontrollable. James says the farmer recognizes after the seed is planted, after the fruit tree or the vine has been 
prepared, a process is then set in motion over which he has very little control. There are factors now beyond his influence, outside his skill and resourcefulness. He cannot predict the weather. He cannot predict the wind and the rain and its timing. He can't predict all the other things like the market. Is it going to be able to be sold if he can even get a crop? So many factors outside his skill and resourcefulness. So he does what he can. And then he waits. He fulfills his part and then he must be patient. When the circumstances are uncontrollable, the first thing we need is patience. The second thing we need, we need here is when the truth is unpopular, we need to act patiently. When the truth is unpopular, sometimes as a follower of Jesus, we have to speak up. Some of you have spoken up during this pandemic. You've had things that you wanted to say to your local MP or MPP. You needed to communicate something to them that was going on in your head and your heart. We have to wait patiently when an act, it, it, as an act of faith when the truth is unpopular. But just make sure for a minute in the midst of this COVID-19 the way you're telling them is the truth. It's not just an opinion you've picked up somewhere that agrees with your feelings. It's not something you found on the internet that aligns with a text of scripture. You see, there's a distinction between what the scriptures clearly articulate and what applications people often offer, offer for them. Big difference there. And here's what I've noticed in crisis after crisis and conflict after conflict. is the only thing that people want to hear is what they want to hear. And they get upset if you tell them anything else. That means that the truth isn't always popular. At critical times when we're asked to speak the truth, there will always be those <laughs> whom the prophet Micah shouted out at the people in Micah 2.11, if liars and deceivers came and say, we will prophesy for you plenty of wine and beer, they would be the prophets for this people. Why? Because nothing of the sort was gonna happen. But it was what the people wanted to hear. And he said, you would just receive that. But friends, we can't be those people. We are called to speak the truth. And today our culture chooses to believe a lot of lies, a lot of things that stand contrary to the clear word of God. And so James' next illustration demonstrates another time when we need patience. When patience is authenticated by faith. Look with me at verse 10 and 11. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. So many things left unsaid there. In other words, the people didn't want to hear a message, but they needed to hear it. And today he said, as followers of Jesus looking back, with the benefit of hindsight, we honor these great men of God. We hold them up highly and read and reread their words as they spoke for God and study them. The duty of the prophet was to inform the people, to encourage them and gently coerce them to change their ways and turn back to God. It was to call people to be different, to change their behavior. The problem was then as it is now that People resist change, even when it's in their best interest. I hate change. <laughs> I, we have done so much changing that when someone says change, even my, some of my favorite people of all get frustrated when I talk about change. They'd rather resent me and my suggestion than consider making another change. And so the prophets had to deal with bringing many unpopular statements from God to the pe people of God. And they were not often well liked and prophets were maligned and often misunderstood. And that's discouraging because all of us like to be liked or at least tolerated by the people around us. But God raised up prophets in Israel because there were problems that could be resolved, issues that could be settled. If a change was made, if an appropriate action was taken and often the prophet's job was to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable and they would not only tell it like it is but they would tell it like it should be and tell it like it could be 
because the truth is frequently not popular, therefore the prophets had to be patient and persevering because the people, even God's people, didn't respond quickly. God had made promise, but their disobedience was causing setbacks, and they were frustrated, threw up their hands, as I've seen so many folks do, and say, this doesn't work. And the prophet would say, but I told you, this, this, and this. You've not completed the task, and so you can't have until you're done. Paul said they had to speak in those circumstances, and frustration began to grow, of course, in their hearts, as it would in your and mine, yours and mine. So Paul added these words for all of us in Ephesians chapter 4.15. Speak the truth in love and we will grow. Speaking the truth in love, we will grow. And become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. We have to speak the truth in love so we can all grow to maturity. And that's what God has called us to, to speak the hard truths of correction call for repentance and change but our motivation to do so must always be love love in that particular verse is the word agape which is the self-sacrificing love doing works and saying words that benefit the loved one and not necessarily the one speaking i don't know if you've ever tried to change somebody's mind but it was a pretty futile task a few times i tried it especially if they could only see from their own perspective. That's what my kids tell me is my problem. So what are you going to do when you're trying to change your husband or your wife, your child or your church? Well, be patient. Because remember, grace is the power of change and the Holy Spirit is the agent of change. He's the, he's the uh, transformation process manager. There it is. Not me and certainly not you either. You and I can speak and encourage, but change comes from a heart open to receive God's grace and prepared to cooperate with the Spirit. So the prophets found that they had to be patient. Macrothumios is the New Testament word for patience. We get our word thermometer from it. It means slow to get hot, slow to heat up, and so much of life is like that that's what patience is it takes a long time to overheat if we're going to be successful with people we're going to have to learn to be patient if we're going to be successful parents we can't get quickly overheated nor quickly overheat our children we got to have a long fuse ourselves and figure out how to gently lengthen theirs too first corinthians 13 4 says that love is patient Patience is what is called for. That means we don't grumble about people while we're waiting. When we're going through tough times that we don't like and we're being forced to wait and experiencing delays, we often start grumbling about the people around us. And James chapter 5 verse 9 says, Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters. Remember, the judge is standing at the door. When do we need to be patient? Well, we need to be patient when circumstances are uncontrollable. When the truth that we have to share is unpopular. You have to be patient with people and just love them when the pain is unbearable and unexplainable as well. And for that, James takes our attention and turns it to a man whose name you are likely familiar with called Job. Job was the wealthiest man in the world in his day. A famous man, had everything he wanted. And in, every, and in one day he lost most of it. He lost all of his crops and all of his children. Lost all of his livestock. And to top it all off, shortly thereafter he was afflicted with a terrible, painful terminal disease. And he had no idea what was going on. There was no explanation. You and I know because we get to read Job chapter 1, but Job doesn't know anything's going on until Job chapter 2. We heard the argument. God bragged on Job and said, Job is a good man. And Satan said, Job, the only reason he's serving you is because he's got it so good. And God said, you don't know my friend Job. And Satan said, it's because you make it so good for him. And God opened the gate to the life of Job. 
and allowed Satan in to assault him, as it were, taking the blessings and the good things out of Job's life. And God allowed Job to be tested. Yet Job served God as God thought he would. Job was patient. James 5, 11, B says this, You've heard of the endurance of Job. Yep, that's what we know about him. The patience of Job. Now, Job paid, played in the Super Bowl of suffering, won the championship, but he was a committed believer in God and his goodness. He lost family and friends and finances and health. You think you've got problems. The only thing he was left with, with his, was, was his wife, who was grieving as deeply as he was. And in a moment of absolute frustration, she shouted to him, curse God and die. Because things were so extremely difficult for both of them. The days were so dark. It appears there was not much of a support system either, if Job's three friends were any kind of example. But the worst of it was that there was no explanation. And that's when we know that waiting and faith go together. Because the pain is inexplicable and excruciating. Yet Job perseveres. For 37 chapters, God is silent, says nothing to him. But in that silence, Job perseveres. He hangs in there, grieves his losses, goes through depression. Just read the book. <laughs> You'll know it. A wide range of difficult emotions, crying out to God, but refusing to curse God and give up his integrity. He maintains his blamelessness and patiently waits on God whom he knows is good and does not understand what is going on. There's a lot of injustice in this world and we've seen it all in this pandemic. Violence and vitriol and the virus and the pain and the protests. All the injustice going on all around us. And reasoning it out is beyond us. And that's what Job was going through. And waiting patiently in those circumstances is an act of faith. That's the first thing. Well, what's the second thing? Well, what should I remember when I'm waiting on God? What should I remember? Well, let's have a look at the three things that James suggests. The first thing is to remember that God is in control. James chapter 5, verse 7, 8, and 9 all contain a phrase that uh, points in the same direction. He said, be patient, patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. Be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. The judge is standing at the door, he said. Three times James says God is coming. Why? Because for James, that's the ultimate proof that God's in control. You see, history is his story. It's linear. History is moving towards a defined end as it had a defined beginning. And then it will have a new beginning. According to the word of God. Everything, friends, is right on schedule. God has a plan. God has a purpose. Revelation chapter 1, verse 7 and 8. John says, look, he comes with the clouds of heaven and everyone will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the nations of the world will mourn for him. Yes, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord. I am the one who is, who always was, and who is still to come, the Almighty One. One day Jesus is going to return. Jesus promised and John saw the vision. We don't know when that day is going to be, but the Bible talks more about Jesus' second coming than it does about his first. We couldn't tell that until he came the first time and we could start to pull the pieces apart. The first one provides the basis for everything. There is no point in a second coming if there wasn't a first. The first one is where we focus now, but we keep in the back of our minds, we keep our eyes fixed on the future because his time is coming and it's nearer now, friends, than when we first believed. James chapter 5 verse 8 says this in the Phillips translation, so you must be patient, resting your hearts on the ultimate certainty. God's in control and God is coming. God's in control. That's resting our hearts on the ultimate certainty. Jesus is going to come back. Nothing's going to move that date that's been set or stop that event. So James said, settle it in your heart. God's in charge. 
no matter what you see. I have to remember, first of all, God's in control. The second thing I need to remember while I'm waiting on God is that God rewards patience. God rewards patience. James chapter 5 and verse 11 says, You know, we call those blessed, happily, happy, spiritually prosperous, favored by God, who were steadfast and endured difficult circumstances. Talking about the prophets, of course. In other words, it pays to be patient. Note that word blessed. And there are all kinds of blessings in life. There are all kinds of rewards. And when you and I are patient, it builds our character. When we're patient, we avoid mistakes. When we're patient, we reach our goals. When we're patient, we are going to be honored by others, Scripture says. When we're patient, we're going to have happier relationships. There are all kinds of benefits to patience. Galatians chapter, nine, chapter 6 verse 9 teach, speaks to us in this hour. It says, let's not get tired because he knows we are. This is a word of encouragement for you and for me in this hour of weariness. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. Or at just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing. The goodness of God is coming for us. And it's just around the corner if we don't get discouraged. And give up there are blessings to be had in your character and mine in your life and mine in our families and in our church and they're not just rewards that happen here when we're patient but some of those rewards are coming to us in a life that stretches beyond this one there are rewards friends in heaven too and this is a trustworthy saying Timothy Paul told Timothy if we die with him we will also live with him and if we endure hardship, we will reign with him. Friends, coming out of this, the right direction. If we have endured hardship, the Bible says that we may reign with him. If we patiently endure. So remember, God's in control. And that's what the farmer is relying upon. Remember, God rewards our patient endurance with a harvest of blessing. And thirdly... This is not the end of the story. That's what I have to remember while I'm waiting on God and the delays just keep coming. This is not the end of the story. A delay is not a denial. James chapter 5 verse 11 talks about Job. You have heard of the endurance of Job and you have seen the Lord's purpose. Notice that. You have seen the Lord's purpose. God knows what he's doing. This is not the end of the story. And see, he said, this is not his purpose, how he richly blessed him. And in the end, inasmuch as the Lord is full of pity and compassion and tenderness and mercy, we read the end of his story and we can see what Job could not see. We know that God's plan for Job started well, that Job hit that rough spot because it was a test. And he came through the test with flying colors. And God restored him double for all of his trouble. And when you have a delay in your life, remember it's not a denial. God will come through as he did with Job. He richly blessed him in the end. Phyllis Brooks was a famous pastor about a hundred years ago. Pacing around in his study like... A madman and clearly frustrated and irritated. His wife said, Philip, what's wrong? He looked up at her and said, I'm in a hurry and God isn't. Can you identify with that? I sure can. A lot of us are in a hurry for have this coronavirus thing over. But I want you to know that while we're waiting, God is working. While we're waiting... God's working. Whatever the problem is in your life and my life, while we're waiting, God is working. In ways that we can't see. Remember the farmer who planted his crop? All the stuff that was going on under the ground that he could not see as the seed germinated and began to grow. All the amazing things that happened out of sight and underground to make that seed sprout. The prophets often grew weary of declaring the word of the Lord, seeing few results. And then God would come along and give the prophet some insight. And he would 
bounce up and down with joy. Why? Because they knew from Israel's history that the word of the Lord could not fail. And guess what? Today, like Job, we're in the same position of enduring patiently, or perhaps not so patiently if you wish, waiting to experience in greater measure what the text promises, the pity and compassion and tenderness and mercy of the Lord. Romans 8.28 says that we know that for those who love God, all things are working together for good. Do you hear the process in there? They're working together for good. There's a process involved and we're in the middle of a process. It's a season of life and we must go through it. While you're waiting, God is working. We need to remember, this is not the end of the story. Israel got pushed off into captivity for their many sins and God said to the prophet Jeremiah, after he wept and wept, for I know the plans and thoughts I have for you, says the Lord, plans for peace and well-being, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. And his hope revived because he knew his God was faithful and true. Your God and mine is faithful and true. I don't know all the problems you're facing right now. Many of them are consequences, I'm sure, of COVID-19 in some form, but I can tell you this, that God has been working behind the scenes and you and I are going to just have to trust him. We're going to have to be patient and not get out in front of him and mess things up before he begins to, un to undo the scroll and show us the future that he has for us. So, when is waiting an act of faith? We've talked about that. What should I remember while I'm waiting on God? We've talked about that. What's the last question? How do I trust God while I'm waiting with all of the delays? Well, the first thing I need to do is wait expectantly. That's what the text tells me to do. Write it down. The farmers, the prophets, Job, all of them. James chapter 5, verse 7 and 8. Let's go back there one last time. The farmer waits expectantly. There it is. For the precious harvest from the land. We wait expectantly. I wait expectantly. That's what the farmer does while he's waiting. He's preparing for the harvest. He's getting ready. He's not just th sitting around thinking, I wonder if it's going to grow or not. He's expecting it to grow. He's confident that God has it all in control. He's a farmer. So he starts to get ready by faith for the harvest so that when it comes, he can harvest it all. And how do we get ready? Well, James tells us, strengthen your hearts. Keep them energized, firmly committed to God. Don't, don't let your faith waver in this hour. So let me ask you a question. What have you been waiting for God to do? Why don't you transform your, maybe it was to transform your marriage or solve a financial problem, to heal a hurt or to reach a loved one for Christ. Well, let me ask, him, ask you this. As you've prayed, have you expected him to do it? God sometimes meets expectations. R expectations rightly brought are met by the Lord because the farmer waits expectantly. He sows the seed, does his part, and waits expectantly for the precious harvest to come from the land. A woman who's pregnant, who is expecting, is doing all kinds of things for nine months getting ready for that baby. She doesn't wait until the baby is delivered to get started. You know what I've discovered? A lot of times we're waiting on God, and God's actually waiting on us. We think we're waiting on Him, and He says, I'm waiting on you. There's some things that you have to do in order for this to come to fruition. So James says, strengthen your hearts, keep them fully energized, be fully committed to God, stay encouraged, get built up in the word. After making a series of promises to Israel, God said this in Isaiah 49, 23, for they shall not be put to shame who wait and hope expectantly for me. I believe that can be you. They will not be put to shame who wait and hope expectantly for me. Secondly, not only do I need to wait expectantly, I need to wait without compromising my integrity. Somebody said the way to do this is to wait without complaining. Well, that might be nice, but it's not what I see in Scripture. Somebody said, well, just show up and shut up. 
Patience, we are told, is to be quiet without complaint. But that misses the mark on so many levels. In fact, if you've ever read the story of Job, quiet is not what he is. Silence is not part of the equation. Job's story tells us in no uncertain terms he complained, and how loudly, as does Jeremiah's story, and the prophet Habakkuk, and so many of the Psalms are filled with the concerns and complaints of those who perceive they've been forgotten or passed over by God's justice that something has gone wrong. And friends, while it's not wrong to complain to God, it is wrong to complain about God. They met the, those who did it met with the anger of God, whether it was Miriam in Numbers 12 or Gora, Dathan, and Abiram in Numbers 16. But note they spoke against God's servant and in doing so spoke against God himself. Somebody said, you're telling me not to talk about the pastor. Aren't we all the servants of the Lord? Aren't you too a servant of the Almighty? Then let us not speak out against one another. The admonition is there. I need to wait without compromising my integrity. And these men and women did. But if we must complain, let it be to him about our own sinfulness so that he will cleanse and forgive us. All of those men I mentioned, Jeremiah, Moses, Habakkuk, and the psalmist, or many of the psalmists because they're not all written by one fella, were people who trusted God in troubles, trials, and tribulations, who did so fully aware of the injustices that they were experiencing. I'm not talking about getting up in the morning and sniveling and whining and being a wimpy saint. These folks that I'm talking about were men's men, strong, influential men. But to do it all with a stiff upper lip, as some of the Brits do, <laughs> that's not necessarily godliness, friends. Patience waiting on God need not be understood as quietude or passivity. I think perhaps genuine patient invo patience involves those realities, but it also involves things like protesting to God about circumstances, yet without surrendering your integrity or impugning God somehow for the problem, not straying from the path of a committed following of Jesus. As we read in verse 9, don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters. How often is it when we're under pressure, we lash out at those who are closest to us and it's not their fault. We have fights in our family and our family didn't cause the stress we were feeling and COVID-19 and all the restrictions and all the people out of work and all the things that are out of whack. It's not fair, it's not right, but it doesn't make it right to take it out on the folks at home. Friends, it's hard to be quiet when you're frustrated and we're all frustrated right now with what's going on. And often we can manage patience as long as we can voice it, but voice your concerns, scripture suggests, towards someone that can give you an answer. There's no point in me telling my auto mechanic about uh, my health issues. I might as well talk to my doctor who can do something. There's no sense in complaining to this pastor about mechanical difficulties with your car. I'm mechanically inept, I can't do a thing. Dear God, help me. <laughs> Go to the source. Go to the proper place. If you're going to complain, take it to the place where something or, or the person where something can get done. I just further complicate an already frustrating situation when I take out my frustrations from the job or with my boss on my wife or my kids. It resolves nothing. The only way to get resolve is to go to the appropriate source and express my concerns in an appropriate manner and seek resolution. We all need to learn to voice our concerns about one another in a manner that's appropriate in a forum that they belong in. God is always prepared to hear from us. Even the prophets, though, when they speak to him about their concerns with the people of God, speak with great care in his presence. Remember, you're speaking to the one who actually knows what's going on. You and I only know what we can see and we don't know what's really going on in the hearts and the minds of others. So the prophets don't voice their concerns to the people but to God himself. 
who may answer if he chooses. And they voice their concerns about the people of God to God. The picture in chapter 5, verse 9 that's on the screen beside me is, Don't grumble against one another, brothers and, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. The problems that James talked about in verses 1 to 6 with the rich. James says, God is about to move in and fix this. Make sure you get out of the way. And don't blame each other for what's going on over there. God's about to fix that. Just stay out of the road. Keep yourselves circumspect. Don't grumble against each other, brothers and sisters. That's not going to fix anything. The New English Bible says, My brothers and sisters, do not blame your troubles on one another, or you will fall under judgment. So the warning comes from James. Don't compromise yourself through speech or action amongst yourselves in frustration. God will judge in every circumstance and how quickly. Stay on the right side of things. Philippians 2 verse 14 to 16 says, Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may be blameless and pure children of God without blemish, though you live in a crooked and perverse society in which you shine as lights in the world. How? By holding fast the word of life. Like the farmer, I wait expectantly. Like the prophets, I wait without compromising my integrity. And like Job, I wait confidently. I wait confidently. I may be frustrated with injustice and sin that is going around me, going on around me, or that I experience myself. But as the Bible said, you've heard of the endurance of Job and you've seen the Lord's purpose, that God has a purpose in it all. Therefore, we wait confidently. When God isn't talking, he hasn't explained to Job why he's in so much pain. Nothing's more frustrating I know of than chronic pain. And all the time he's going through day after day of pain and he's lost everything, yet he waits confidently. He kind of rises to the surface every once in a while as he does in chapter 13 and says, Though he slay me, or even if he slays me, I will hope in him. I will surely defend my ways to his face. Moreover, this will become my deliverance. Because if I get to deliver my, my side of the story in his presence, no godless person gets there. That means it's all okay. Job waits confidently. He trusts God, depends on God completely. He throws himself entirely on the Lord. He considers the possibility of his own death and realizes there is nowhere else to turn, no one else he can depend on. In death there is no one that can save or deliver you or bring you comfort and hope. Yet, though he slay me, yet will I hope in him. In faith, Job, Job hoped in God entirely. Though his situation looked hopeless, he had lost much, including his own health, contemplating the possibility that God might slay him on top of it all. Things sure looked bad, but Job looks in hope beyond the circumstances to the God that he knows who is good, to eternal things that God has in store from him. Hope describes the child of God's life in this world. Job's faith is a patient, confident waiting on the Lord. In faith he rested and believed his word and hoped beyond the present, hoped beyond this life, but he endured. You have heard of the endurance of Job and you have seen the Lord's purpose. And now it comes and how he richly blessed him in the end. And as much as the Lord is full of pity and compassion, tenderness, and mercy, trust in God, Job endured under a heavy burden. No, Job was far from perfect. If you read the confrontation that God has with him at the end, he was quite stern with him. But there was one thing that Job did in the midst of it all. He hung on to his God. He clung to God. Someone has said the way that you spell hope in the midst of a challenge like the one we're going through is H-O-P-E. Hope is spelled like this, holding on, praying, 
expectantly. I think that summarizes our study today quite well. Holding on, praying expectantly. Therefore, the writer of the Hebrews said, Don't throw away your confidence, which has great reward, for you have need of endurance. Oh, there it is. So that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. God has precious promises for his friends if we will endure to the end. Somebody looks at me and says to me, But Jim, I'm so weary. Yeah, got it. Got it. But here's what I know. Those who wait on the Lord, there it is, renew their strength. Mount up with wings as eagles. They run and don't get weary. They walk and don't faint. So wait. Patiently. In the midst of delays. Get your strength back. That's what James said. Get your strength back. Hold firmly. Get steady. Wait on the Lord. Renew your strength. Mount up with eagles. How are we going to do all that? We're going to hope. We're going to hold on, praying, expecting that God will come through. And by the time you and I see each other at Bible study again in September, it will be a whole new ball game. The graciousness of Almighty God. May it be so. Let me wrap this up by asking where you need patience today. Some uncontrollable circumstances in your life, I'm sure there's a few. Some of you have probably suffered financial reversals. Maybe you've got a long-term illness or some job responsibilities that have just been overwhelming because of the circumstances that have happened in this pandemic. None of it seems to make any sense. You've pled with God for change and things haven't come out quite the way that you hoped. But friends, today we have hope. We are holding on. Praying expectantly, recognizing that God is in control. Nothing is beyond his power. He's bigger than this whole thing, and his purpose for your life and mine is greater than the problem. God is still on his throne, and he remembers his own. His promise is true. He'll not forget you. Why? God is still on the throne. Would you bow your head with me? Let's pray together as we wrap up this time. Lord, help me to wait patiently to prepare for, you, for the answer. To wait for the direction that I need to have for the days that are in front of us, Lord. For all the challenges that are there that, that, that I can't even see yet. The things you know I pray for my friends who are listening with me that with them also you will give them the grace and the patience to wait to demonstrate themselves as you're working to demonstrate through me I pray that we can endure demonstrate that we are your children and that we wait patiently on our Lord and our God who answers prayer. So we continue to pray to you, O God, believing for a bright future, as bright as your promises, Lord. Lord, we pray that we will be able to maintain our integrity under pressure, not take out our frustrations on the people that are closest to us. Help us to wait confidently to be still and not get anxious, not get worried, not get nervous. Help us to hope, to hold on praying expectantly as you work to bring things in our lives together and bring our culture back into your order so that we can step into it prepared, refreshed, and renewed to face the things that tomorrow will most certainly bring. Thank you, Jesus, for coming. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your working in our lives in these days. And as we step into this summer season, don't cease to work among us and in us. May we be the people that you need us to be in the days that are ahead of us. For your honor and for your glory alone, we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen and amen. 
Amen. Well, I trust you were able to pray the prayer with me today. And uh, I've been praying for you that all will be well with you and your body will be as healthy as your soul is. And some of you have got pretty healthy souls from the way you've been talking these past few weeks. We've been very grateful for your giving. We're proceeding with some renovations at the facility right now. We thought you wouldn't be back yet. And we're still waiting for contractors. So you'll see things a little bit in disarray in the next number of weeks and perhaps months. But God's at work and we're so grateful for all that you've done and your faithfulness in giving. Thank you for your very consistent support through all of this. If you're looking for Facebook updates, what's happening? What's coming next? Well, plug into your search engine, Full Gospel Church of Niagara. What should come up is the website and the Facebook page. Go to the Facebook page. They're the most up-to-date things are going on. We just heard today that as of June the 30th, which is next Wednesday, we will be allowed on Sundays to have up to 25% capacity in the facility. So for the first Sunday of July, for that communion Sunday, July the 4th, we will be allowed to have more folks in the house than so far. And so if you haven't already registered for the service, why don't you do that? Caitlin will have the, th have the sign up thing going up shortly for this week. And this week we're still capped at 15%, but next Sunday, not the one coming, but the one after that, the first Sunday in July, we'll be able to take some extra folks and maybe you'll be able to get in for a an in-person communion service. What a joy that will be this Sunday. We hope to do a baby dedication, God willing. It's going to be a great Sunday. For Please don't miss out. If you can't get in, please make sure you connect with us. The live stream is still running. Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. Check the Facebook page for the link so that you can get there and be part of all that's going on. Well, as the summer rolls out in front of us and the heat starts to come, thank God for the I pray that you will go in peace and that you will have a great summer and that the word of the Lord that we have studied and shared together will bless you and bring you back safely as we celebrate together his goodness and his love. Amen.